Hi, everyone. Welcome to Neolithium's Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Waldo Perez, CEO and Director. We're also joined today by Carlos Vincent, CFO of Neolithium. He'll be leading the Q&A session. Waldo is going to first walk you through a company presentation, and then we will be accepting questions. As a reminder, please submit your questions in the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. A copy of today's presentation and a fact sheet is also available for downloads in the handouts tab. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Waldo to kick things off. Welcome. We are going to talk about the Tres Quebradas Lithium project. Um, you can go through the screen and the first thing I want to talk about is uh, a little bit about the, the market. Um, there are very good news for the planet. The EV sales forecast to reach 3% global sales in 2020 and is increasing every year significantly. There is a lot of regulation going through each country that is actually forcing or is actually suggesting or is actually encouraging through um, taxation and, 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 other, and other ways to actually um, uh, encourage or increase penetration of electric vehicles worldwide. The question is, what's going to happen in the future? If today if penetration of electric cars is about 3%, what's going to happen in 2030, for example, or in 2040? As you can see here from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, but actually Roskill has a very similar view. The total number of electric vehicles uh, is going to range around between 24% and 32% total penetration. That is, every 100 cars sold, around 30 are going to be electric in the year uh, in the year 2030. Um, these estimations, as I say, done by most of the analysts, um, suggest a very strong penetration. And you can see here um, how towards the year 2040, most of the vehicles sold are going to be electric. Um, if that prediction is real, then how much lithium will be required to actually uh, transform all these electric cars, or shall I say, to sell all these electric cars in the market? Here, in the next page, you have the estimation done by Roskill and Benchmark with 30% penetration to 2030. What you see as blue bars from the year 2020 to 2030 is production of a, a lithium carbonate. In other words, we are now transforming electric vehicles penetration into the need or into lithium carbonate that it needs to be get into this car to, to, to build the battery. So today, the market of lithium carbonate is around 350,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year. Now, with 30% penetration, which is, as I say, Roskill and Benchmark prediction for the year 2030, the world will need 1.2 million tons lithium carbonate produced in 10 years. That means that the market needs to quadruple in three years. That actually is very difficult to achieve, but this is the requirement if we are going to sell 30% of total cars electric in 2030. Now, this sounds like a, an interesting challenge, but notice what Elon Musk predicted for his company, Tesla. He announced in the Tesla day that he will need 2.4 million tons of lithium carbonate only for Tesla cars by the year 2030. So you can see that he is much more optimistic in terms of how many cars are going to be electric in the year 2030. And he's only talking about his own company. Tesla is not the number one uh, electric car in the world in terms of volume. Uh, therefore, um, this or his view is actually a lot more optimistic than any other analyst. In any case, in both cases, we will require to open four new mines or eight new mines for every mine in operation today producing lithium. This is a very difficult challenge to achieve, but uh, this is the market we are getting into. 
in the next uh, screen we can see that uh, the imbalance um, that is, uh, is is causing um, this situation or the magnitude of the imbalance is in the order of billions or million tons of lithium carbonate. Okay, um, so there is going to be a, a structural deficit in the market by next year, very clearly. Um, the number of mines that need to be open is, is mind-boggling, and uh, the announcement of uh, electric uh, uh, of, of car uh, manufacturers um, that uh, of, of the number of electric cars coming in the next uh, generation, in the next year, in the next two years, simply tell us that um, this situation is going to be very difficult. There's going to be a big challenge for uh, battery makers to get the supply of a product that today is, is not being produced at this magnitude at all. Um, something very important that happened this year is uh, the pandemic, the COVID, and what happened with electric cars. As a matter of fact, electric sales, electric vehicle sales in Europe have reached an all level increase of 76%. China uh, also increased uh, this year sales for almost 20%. And of course, the global stimulus plans um, that have been put in uh, in place in Europe and in uh, in many other countries are also pushing the transformation of uh, transportation towards electric cars. So uh, OEMs are getting ready for record electric vehicles demand next year, and this is starting to push demand and is starting to push pricing. All forecasts are revised upwards nowadays, all of them. Um, when you actually Google information about uh, lithium pricing, uh, everybody agrees that uh, the prices are going to increase. So how much and exactly how this is going to be unveiled and the exact days and months that uh, the situation will get into a, a strain, nobody knows. But very clearly, there is the all, all communities, all the market agree that this is happening and is happening sooner than expected. So within that thriving industry, within that incredible opportunity to develop new lithium projects, I want to show you the 3Q project, which is one of the best lithium brine projects worldwide. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about our history. We discovered this project in December 2015. Six months later, we were a public company and we already raised like $40 million. And uh, after that, we had four years of very hard work. Uh, we raised a total of approximately 100 million Canadian in total. Um, and we have completed our exploration, our resource estimation, our reserve estimation the initial preliminary economic assessment, as well as a pre-feasibility. And by now, we have a plant that produces lithium carbonate at battery grade, and we have just closed a strategic investment with CATL, the largest battery manufacturer in the world. All that, that includes, of course, all the permitting in place, all the mineral property in place and so on, only in record time of four years. So let me tell you how we did that, and let me show you a little bit more about our project. First of all, location. The Lithium Triangle is a region composed by Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, um, where there are specific basins, and in those basins there are salars or salt flats. The brine is hosted in the porous space of the salt, and um, there is approximately a thousand salars, but if a handful of them, like 10, have any significant size and also very few contain any significant lithium. Um, this area, this region, uh, concentrates about 40% of the global production of brine and 90% of the brine resources. And actually 60% of all lithium in the world is hosted in this place. We are in the southern end of the lithium triangle. And we have a very specific uniqueness to our project. As you see, Every, of the big, every one of the big salars have several companies operating. Atacama, the biggest brine lithium producer in the world, has two companies operating on the same salar. 
that is extracting the brine from the same basin. Olaros Cauchari, a single salar with two companies operating. The same happened in Hombre Muerto with FMC, a previous Levent, Galaxy, Post, and so on. Now, we are one of the few companies in the world that have the entire salar for ourselves. So we own the entire land tenure. The entire salar uh, belongs to, 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 to Neolithium. This is a very unique and very important situation because you can plan the extraction and the well uh, field in a way that will not interfere with anybody else. There is no anybody else. So this is very important and it's a great advantage of our company. In terms of the permitting, we have completed uh, all the permits that are required. We have granted the mining, the mining um, uh, permits to mine the, the, the ground for 99 years over our entire ground. We have a tax stability treaty with the government for 30 years. We have a, a, a surface use uh, easement agreement. Uh, we also have the access agreement, that is the access, or the road access agreement. Um, we have all the permits obtained from the environmental baseline, the environmental permits for the chemical plant, the environmental permits for the exploration and the development. And the only permit that is missing is actually the construction permit that is soon to be approved. Um, and this usually is provided when you start construction. So the permitting is really in this project, a, a, a process that has been completed. Look, uh, the exploration work in the next page uh, that we have completed, okay? 50 kilometers of seismic um, reflection survey, 48 drill holes, 23 uh, pump tests, and, and production wells that produce up to 100 liters per second. With all this exploration work completed up to up to this year, we have measured an indicated resource of 4 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent, inferred resource of 3 million tons, and proven and probable reserve of 1.2 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent, will give us a mine life of 35 years um, if we mine 20,000 tons per year. Um, notice also very importantly the grade. Over the, the first 10 years, our grade is going to be over 1,000 milligrams per liter lithium. This is one of the highest grade lithium projects in the world. And I will further develop on that. Why is that so important? Um, notice that after 35 years of production, the grade of this project is still higher than most other current producers of brine in the world. So it, it, it's an outstanding project from the grade perspective. Um, our resource goes down 640 meters, but the reserve goes only down 100 meters. So there is plenty of, of, of space, of blue sky to grow, to produce more. So we can increase production from 20 to 40 to 60,000 tons of lithium carbonate with no significant issues with the current resource that we already have. So it's a very large, high grade resource. Here is a comparison. Uh, table where I show you uh, all projects worldwide and notice that our project is actually the third highest grade project worldwide and the second of the undeveloped projects. The blue are projects that are undeveloped and the green are the projects that have been uh, developed that, uh, that are in production. Uh, so it's one of the few high grade projects that remain uh, without uh, being in production. Notice that we double a grade of, of many other projects, okay, uh, with significant blue sky, blue sky. Here is a complex table that I want you to to take a look one second and, 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 and let me explain, give me the opportunity to explain why this is important. The size of the bubbles is the grade and the axis, X and Y axis, are showing you the impurities in the brine. The brine is a liquid, a liquid trapped in the rock. And this brine is, this liquid is what contains the lithium, but not only contains lithium, contains also other elements, impurities. Some of them are, uh, are uh, very bad pro for production. The two that are really bad are magnesium and sulfate. Both of them combine with lithium. And when they combine with lithium, precipitate in a clay that is very difficult to, to break. And that's why you need to avoid brines that contain sulfate or magnesium. And if your brine contains sulfate or magnesium, you need to remove that before you are able to concentrate. So 
what you see here again in green are the projects in production and the blue are the projects that are in development and you can see that all the projects in production are projects that have two conditions high grade the size of the bubble and also they are close to the zero axis or they are close to the origin because the closer you are to the origin the lower impurities you have now notice something not only we are very good grade very high the, the size of the diameter of the bubble we are the lowest impurity project worldwide this is critical in uh, understanding why our production cost is going to be very low cost we have low cost because we have low impurities the lower the impurity the lower the cost of removing those impurities and therefore uh, the, the lower the operational cost of the project this is very important and some projects like ujuni that have very high um, impurities were never being were never able to enter in production simply because the cost of cleaning the impurities is higher than the cost of production very important uh, i'm showing you here the 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 the, the pumping uh, of, of a production well. What you see here is a 20 centimeter diameter pipe. And the pipe is actually extracting brine from the salar, from the porous space uh, of the salt. And in this case, this is extracting uh, 100 liters per second. These 100 liters per second production uh, allow us to only need four wells to be in full production for this salar. Four wells allow us to produce 20,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year. Uh, this is basically the yield or the productivity of the salar, meaning that it's very porous and therefore the brine flows very easily and you need very few wells to be in production. Just for comparison, Oro Cobre requires like 100 wells to have a smaller production than ours. So obviously that has an impact on the capital cost, also on the operational cost. It's more expensive to operate many smaller wells than, than few big wells. And therefore that has an impact on the capex and the opex. That also explains why this project is so good. Very high yield of the rock that produce the brine and near surface. Okay. We have developed a proven process. Um, what I'm showing you here in schematics shows two areas. The top is the Salar and the down is the Fiambala site or the city. Um, it is actually easier to evaporate the brine in the Salar because it has a very high evaporation rate. And when you have the maximum concentration, around 3% uh, lithium in the brine, transport the brine with trucks to the project in the city. In the city, there is a very simple uh, process that allow us to go through the um, production of lithium carbonate. I will further describe this, but I'm just trying to make the point that there are two sites. One is the Salar and the other is the city. You only need 11 uh, trucks a day of brine uh, that you need to process for 20,000 tons a year production. So it's a very straightforward uh, transportation not big issue and it's easier easier to transport the brine to the to the town than transport the people to operate the, the plant uh, in the salar and that's why uh, we do it that way by the way it's the same way that Albemarle and SQM the largest lithium producer in the world do exactly the same thing okay. here you have uh, the pilot evaporation pond strings which is basically the, the portion that you have up in the salar. What you see here are ponds. They are very large. And the dots that you see there in the center up is actually um, cars, vehicles. And what, what you see of these large ponds, they are 140 by 70, by, 30, by 50 meters approximately, 140 meters long. What you see here is where the brine once it comes out of the of the of the salar, goes to sit and evaporate into these ponds. When the brine evaporates, the lithium concentrate and other unwanted elements precipitate. For example, sodium chloride in the first two big ponds. In the pond to the right, 
potash or potassium chloride. And in the left, that is yellow, uh, that is the, the brine that concentrates the lithium. The yellow is usually related to lithium brine. That is, the, the, the yellow color is given by the lithium. Um, then you have at the bottom right a crystallizer, which is basically a, a very simple machine that separates still floating crystals from the brine to uh, get rid of the crystal and keep the, the, the concentrated brine to be shipped in trucks to the city uh, where we do the process. This is our plant in the city of Fiambala. This is a pilot plant, it's one in 600 scale, and basically goes through a very simple process that will allow us to produce lithium carbonate battery rate. This process and this technology is unique for this project, but it's a standard technology. Nothing new, nothing too different from what other producers already do uh, in, as I say, Albert Mayer, for example, or Sokimich in, in Chile and so on. So this is um, a technology that is easy to, to, to handle and it can be also operated by local people. We have a large team, we have nine chemical engineers uh, and of course uh, local personnel and we are able to produce here in our next picture uh, battery grade lithium carbonate with this technology. And this is very important because now it's validation time. When we talk about this, this is not brine that was sent for a lab in Germany and somebody there in a high technology lab have put, you know, extracted lithium from that. Um, because mines are not built that way, okay? This is not a metallurgical sample. This is actually production today at pilot scale. This is what you need to be sure that you're going to be successful when you construct the mine. We don't have technical or technological questions. It's a matter of scaling and of course of financing, but we already produce 99.6 battery grade lithium carbonate in our plant with our personnel in exactly the same place where the final plant is going to be built. Um, with this work that we have completed, we obtain a outstanding results in our pre-feasibility study. Um, it, this is uh, a project with a valuation of $1.1 billion that has a whopping internal rate of return of 50%. Uh, very few mining business get an internal rate of return so high. The reason for that, very low capex, less than $320 million, and very low operational cost. Now, I want to make a break there. Usually, the bigger the project, the bigger the capex, and then maybe, depending the metal you're mining, the lower the operational cost. So big mines usually have lower operational cost than small mines and so on. But this project is very peculiar. Because of the high grade, we need small installations, small uh, capex. Uh, but because of the, um, of the low impurities, and the characteristics of the project, it also has a very low operational cost. And this, Low capex and low opex is actually what makes an internal rate of return so high. This plan was uh, done for uh, 35 years production and 20,000 tons of lithium carbonate. Although we can expand uh, production and we can expand the mine life uh, beyond that. So our view is conservative uh, and it's actually very easy to finance. That's why we went through 20,000 tons of lithium carbonate right now, because it's easy to finance with a payback that is less than two years. And uh, how these compare with other producers? You know, how do we look like with the rest? Well, uh, Roskill have done an interesting analysis uh, comparing other projects worldwide that are in development. And uh, they show that our pure processing cost is the lowest or is going to be the lowest in industry. Nobody else that is uh, planning to build a mine is planning to have a operational cost as, uh, as we do. Um, and just for reference, Sal de Vida, which is right beside our Tres Quebradas project, is also a very good low impurity project. So you can see at least there that the impurities do play an important, uh, an important part of this game. Uh, in the next, you have the CAPEX peer comparison. In other words, companies that are planning to produce lithium carbonate uh, with other projects. And again, in CAPEX, we have the lowest 
capex requirement per ton of lithium carbonate produced. We need $16,000 to produce a ton of uh, lithium carbonate, uh, uh, of, of, of lithium carbonate as installed capacity. It's actually the lowest in the world. Again, that's thanks to the, to the grade. In the small circle that is on top of the, of the bar is actually the mine life. And you can see that also our project is one of the longest mine life projects worldwide. And all this information, all these that I have just shown you, the, the feasibility study, the uh, capacity to produce from those wells at high yield, the uh, excellent grade, the excellent, uh, uh, the low impurities, all that draw the attention of the major companies. And we decided to partner with CATL, which is actually the largest battery manufacturer in the world. They build batteries for Tesla, for Toyota, for BMW, for Mercedes. They actually not only are the number one, they have been doubling production of lithium batteries every year for five years in a row. That is an amazing achievement. As a matter of fact, I think that we have to go back to Henry Ford to hear an industrial achievement like that. Doubling production every year for five years in a row. Now, of course, doubling production every year means doubling consumption of lithium carbonate every year for five years in a row. And this is where they come to us. Um, and very importantly, uh, this company have set aside a $2 billion, um, a $2 billion fund that uh, is to be used to improve the upstream supply uh, for, uh, that they, they require. And of course, that is where we, we stand. The deal that we did with CATL, they become uh, shareholders of our company. They acquire stock of our company. They own now 8%. They pay a premium over, over, over the, the price at the time, 30% over market. Um, and basically that money will be used to finalize the feasibility study with them. And that will allow to complete the validation of the 3Q project at one of the most important projects worldwide. Um, a technical committee is created uh, with CATL and we together would supervise the completion of the final feasibility study by independent engineering companies. Uh, they will also be sitting in the board with us. Um, so this is a very important point, you know, um, for any investor, you know, how are we evaluated with respect to other companies? Uh, we are still, with respect to the price uh, net asset value, very undervalued with respect to all our peers. So this is an analysis that each one of you have to do, but it's important to show that there is very strong room for growth in the price of our company in the short term, in the short term, because a feasibility study is only a few months away to being completed with our partner. And after we finish that, complete financing and start construction. So this is a very good opportunity because the asset is significantly undervalued. Uh, we have a very strong capital structure. Um, we are actually higher priced than what we show in the, in the, in the image here because there was a change in, the, in pricing in the last week or so. But in any case, um, uh, very importantly, we have no doubt, no, no debt, $29 million in cash in the bank, plus the $9 million that are entering from the deal with uh, CITL. Um, we actually issued a press release today. The first set of approval have been obtained already by the Chinese government. So we are only waiting for a final approval uh, to complete the transaction. Uh, insider ownership uh, is about 10%. Um, I am the largest personal shareholder. Uh, institutions have uh, more shares than I have, like BlackRock, McKinsey and Sprott. So I want to be sure that the valuation of this project and the price, the stock price of this company is um, a, a fair value for the type of premium project that this company has. Um, so, what is next? Where are we standing right now? In record time, we completed resource, reserves, exploration, feasibility, pre-feasibility, 
um, in record time we obtain all the permits that are required to build this and we selected a premium strategic partner this was done in merely you know four years uh, right now we are at the final end of this story we are now uh, completing the feasibility which is six to nine months away uh, get the final permit for the construction of this project and uh, basically complete the financing with our partners CATL and potentially others and start construction plan so this is a very important news um, and, and this is actually coming and unleashing in the next uh, few months so why neolithium why neolithium we own a brine lithium project that has high grade and low impurity is a premium project from its chemistry is third highest grade project in the world and lowest impurity project in the world we have a very large resource and reserve um, actually the the project can grow in terms of annual production as well as on mine life so the, the resource and reserve is huge we haven't planned to develop all of it at the same time or at once uh, because of the capital requirements that require but there is a very large resource and reserve plenty of blue sky to continue exploring or to increase and increase production immediately we use very simple evaporation process we don't use um, any rare technology this is proven technology that is already operating in the region and we have people and personnel that have operated those same mines and those same uh, technologies in the past with other projects we have very strong economics because of course if you have high grade high resource low impurities uh well you your economics are going to be strong one way or another and um, we own 100 percent of this project this is not the case of almost every other salar every other salar is shared among multiple partners we own 100 percent of this and we managed to secure the catl the largest battery manufacturer in the world i can't think of a better validation for your money if the largest battery manufacturer is partnering with us, you should partner with us. I mean, um, there is no better validation money than that. And because of that reason, we know that we will be the next major lithium producer. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Waldo, for your presentation. Um, my name is Carlos Vicens, and I'm the CFO of Neolithium. And um, right now, what we're going to do is that we're going to go through some of the questions that have been coming through the Q&A tab. Um, we would like to uh, tell everybody, if they have any questions, please fill out uh, on the right-hand side. You'll see a QA and a tab, and you can ask any question that you feel is appropriate. And uh, let's get down to it. Uh, one thing that I want to mention, there are several questions that are going to be very similar in nature. So I will try to kind of uh, ask the question in a way that answers more than one at the time. Uh, we have quite a few, but we have some time to go through a lot of them. So let's start from the top. Um, okay, Walo, well, the first question, uh, can you tell us a bit, and I think you just answered that uh, just recent, uh, but can you tell us a bit about CATL and the significance of their investment in Neolithium Corp? Well, uh, the CATL, as I mentioned, is, is, is the largest battery manufacturer in the world. It's a very large company. Um, CATL is not a miner. CATL have no interest in, in, in mining. They are an industrial, a technology company, but they figure out that uh, there is a need for raw material for what is coming next. What is coming next is um, a consumption or, or a production of, 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 of batteries to an extent that have never done before. That's why Elon Musk was talking about uh, the terawatt factory now instead of the gigawatt factory. Um, so CATL um, understand that, that, that's why they created a, a, a fund to finance upstream because um, I will give you just an idea of what we require here. If Elon Musk is right, and in the year 2030, we will be consuming over two, three million tons of lithium carbonate per year, we need 80 new mines, eight zero, not eight, 80 new lithium mines. 
Um, nobody can even figure out where, where are those 18 new mines. But in any case, um, these projects like ours will be financed and CATL is a premium partner for that um, with a lot of technological experience. So I can very clearly see that this is a win-win situation. They need the lithium, we want to sell the lithium and they have uh, unlimited supply of money with respect to the amount of money that we require. Uh, that doesn't mean that nobody gives money away. This, nothing is going to be free. Don't get uh, fooled by that. Uh, but it's very clear that we are both interested, very interested in developing this project. Thank you, Waldo. And the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, if, if we would to if we would ask ourselves, what would be the perfect uh, partner for us, apart from the fact of having deep pockets and having the capital to put uh, some money into the project to finance it is having know-how and help us on the technology front. And, and CATL brings us that. And on the downstream side, which is the chemical portion and how to produce the products that are gonna be sold to the end market, that is what CATL excels on. And uh, we believe that th this, this partner uh, is essentially the partner we would, we would wanna have going forward. And uh, okay, let's go to the next question. Why is the th 3Q Solar different? that in terms of impurities and grade to other solars? That's a great question. I, I find a lot of fun actually in, in, in that. Um, think that salars are garbage cans. It's a garbage can. It's a garbage can of nature. So everything that is in a basin ends up in the salar. And therefore, the chemistry of each salar is different because depends on the rocks that surround the salar. So if you are surrounded by rocks that contain sulfate, magnesium, calcium, boron, whatever, all that ends up in the salar. So every basin has a different chemistry and every basin is controlled, regulated, or shall I say, um, uh, influenced by the chemistry of the rocks that are on surface at that, um, at that place. Therefore, in our case, we were lucky enough that our basin contains uh, very little rocks with sulfates or no rocks with sulfates and no rock with magnesium or no significant one. And therefore, most of the brine is actually coming from, uh, uh, from rocks that are leach and are tough. There is actually a video I invite you to see in our, in our website, please, where we talk about the origin of lithium. And there you can see in that video that in our case, the origin of lithium is through hot springs that are leaching tufts, and those tufts contain lithium and do not contain magnesium and do not contain uh, sulfate. So this is what controls uh, the, the basin, basically. Um, so it's a very interesting geological phenomenon. Okay, thank you. And how is the capex divided in general uh, between salar and the plant? Yeah, in general. If your grade, if your grade is not great, it's about 50-50. If your grade is low, it could be 80-90, 80-20, meaning everything is pawns. In our case, because we, in other words, what I'm trying to say is the plant is always about the same cost. Um, a plant costs about $200 million more, give it or take it, you know, a plant. But what is different is the pond. The bigger the pond size, the bigger the the, 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 the size, um, the, the bigger the ponds, the lower the grade, the bigger the ponds, the bigger the coast. So in general, worldwide is about 50-50 brine versus ponds. But because of our high grade, we actually save money in ponds. And in our case, the ponds are about 70, 80 million dollars and the plant is about 200 and the rest is other infrastructure related and wells and so on. So, so the grade allow us to save money in ponds. Okay. Um, can you provide a general overview of the Argentina situation? Yes. Well, Argentina had a very difficult year in terms of a pandemic. Uh, the COVID, the numbers are are were really bad. Like it got to be uh, like the eighth country in the world with more more virus. Right now, it decreased, and right now Spain, England, and other countries have again overtaken because of the second wave. The 
the virus, the virus, the government reacted as every government did with the pandemic, uh, closing the economy or shall I say, restricting traveling and restricting business, uh, restricting the opening of business because there was no other alternative really. There was a lot of virus in Argentina and therefore that creating economic crisis which you know circled back into uh, Argentina difficult economic situation okay now uh, having said all of that we got into the summer now the cases are receding significantly we have almost a month of less and less cases in Argentina we have today a uh, half or or around less than half what we had a month ago in terms of number of cases uh number of deaths are also declining um and the the country or the economy is again opening up with business being open and so on actually as a matter of fact uh, we published today we we return our engineers and we are starting production of lithium carbonate again so the situation is getting back to normal little by little so uh, argentina is going to be hurt by the pandemic and the economic situation no question the rest of the world will also be hurt uh, it's not going to be difficult, um, and and we will all have to deal with that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, next question: Will the lithium plant use a solvent extraction process, and who will ultimately engineer this lithium plant? Uh, okay. Good question. Um, just for for reference, the pilot plant that we have was a uh, engineer uh, originally with GHC, uh, an Australian company with offices in Chile. Uh, we, we proceeded with the, with the Chilean Research Institute to build the plant and operate the plant first in Chile. Then we moved the plant to Argentina and we operate in Argentina. Uh, so shall I say that the technology is proven because we are producing lithium carbonate battery grade with the plant that we have. Now, it's a question of uh, uh, scaling up. And we are, well, we, we, we already say that, I mean, uh, Wally Parson is actually doing a, a portion of that scale up, the Australian company. Um, and actually, uh, we are also uh, seeing other contractors for the final feasibility study. So the who is going to engineer the plant have not been decided yet, in part because we need to give a word to our friends at CATL to be comfortable with it. But we are moving, we are working today uh, with several contractors. One of them is Wally Parson. Okay. Um, what mining or engineering work do you need to finish to get into actual production of lithium carbonate? And when do you estimate to you that you will be actually in production? Look, uh, we don't have, you know, what we are doing today uh, and we're finishing is the scaling studies, scaling studies. So basically you have, just to explain, you have one process where you are doing certain specific uh, work on your brine. Um, it just, because somebody talked about solvent extraction, we go solvent extraction, okay. We know that the process work, but now we are fine tuning and we are saying, okay, the projects, the process works, we want to know the exact cell size and how much consumption we're gonna have of, of the reagent or in this case of the solvent and so on. So we are fine tuning the process and that requires at each step uh, doing a specific experiment. That is exactly what we are doing and uh, we are very close to finish and that then the next step is the scaling up of course the quotations for equipment the quotation for uh logistic transport and so on so we estimate that the the feasibility study should be finished somewhere between in the next six to nine months and i guess the the next part of the question was when do you estimate if everything goes as planned that you'll be in production well, uh, if everything goes as planned and we can start construction next year, um, which is 2021, we would be in production in 2023. And there is a ramp up that goes 24 and 25, simply because these projects, you know, take some time to ramp up. 
Okay. Um, why did you stop the reserve calculation at 100 meters? Oh, good question. Because um, we have some wells, if I recall correctly, seven or eight wells down to 600 meters. But we have like, um, like 40 wells at the 100 meters. So when so we have more wells that are shallow than are deep and the deep holes are spread or separated to each other so if we want to increase the certainty and convert resources into reserves down below we need to do more deeper wells which can be done of course we just are taking the low hanging fruit and, and the cheaper holes and the more easy to do are the ones that are near surface so these are the ones the first one that we will take Okay, um, I have other questions here that came through. Um, I have a lot more, but some questions that came through uh, email. Assuming success of the 3Q project within the next few years, what would NLC or Neo Neolithium do next? Would you consider taking your expertise to new lithium sites? <laughs> well, that would be the second because we already took the expertise. We, we, we founded Lithium Americas before. Eh? Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, well, someday you want to retire too. <laughs> No, no, of course. I mean, the company will continue seeking opportunities, of course, of course, of course. Uh, we are focused here because we need to focus. But definitely the company will be continue seeking opportunities. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, the next one. Um, this is a, a, a long one, but okay. Neolithium, uh, back in April of 2019, announced the submission of the EIA for the 3Q project. Uh, to the government authorities in, in Catamarca and Argentina. Uh, at that time, it was expected that the final construction permit process uh, would have been given or obtained at the end of 2019. What is the current situation uh, of the EIA uh, by the authorities uh, and the mining permit, the final mining construction permit? Yeah, uh, they review everything. There is no objection. It's ready for approval. And the approval will come when we inform the government that we are finance. So we need to be finance or we need to have security of financing and the approval. But the entire report has been reviewed back and forward with us and there are no uh, objections to the work that we want to do. So everything is, is, is ready to get approved as soon as we inform the government that we are finance. Okay. Um, what is the payroll and how many staff do you have uh, currently at the project level? The payroll, okay, the staff that we have in, in the project is about 65 people. Um, and the question would be the, the total payroll, that, that's what well, it is. Well, I mean, I, I, can, I guess I could answer that a little bit. I mean, it, it's at yeah. around 100, 100 US thousand uh, dollars per month, right, that, that we pay a bit less, I guess, depending on the exchange rate and, and the time of the year. Uh, that we pay in Argentina. That doesn't count, of course, the the SGNA at the corporate level. Uh, so you know, it's not it's not a big number. But look, as we develop the project, uh, we're going to hire new people. We're going to hire potentially more expensive people, both at the project level and also at the corporate level, depending on how advanced we are. Uh, so things will change, and it is not something that we can uh, project uh, on a clear line and steady over the next few years. This is a growth uh, period of our company, but. Um, you know, we, we run our company pretty lean, uh, even though we do have quite a bit of staff in, in Argentina. I think that's, that's very valuable. And it's specifically in these times when you have COVID situation that we can definitely uh, have people on the ground dealing with any potential uh, issues that come up uh, during this time. So in Canada, we have one person, which is me, uh, dealing with the majority of the things that, at a corporate level. Uh, Waldo is out in Argentina, he's our CEO. Our CEO is also Argentinian. Our technical staff, engineering staff are there. So you know, we, we, we believe that's a, a, a positive thing for us to have local people, which are not as expensive as expats going up and down and not being able to travel. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, so the next question would be, um, I guess maybe I could answer this one, but I'll, I'll put it up. Uh, what financing do you have in place, debt and equity to start production? And do you have term sheets for the debt? Um, you want, want to answer that or I, I answer that? No, no, you can, please. 
Okay, we, we still don't have a final financing in place. We are currently working on that. And, and, the, and the reason we hired Bank of America last year is to exactly do just that. Um, we brought CATL as our potential partner and hopefully our final partner to, uh, to have a complete financing solution. We don't have uh, any equity or debt just yet finalized. Uh, that, and that is exactly why what we're doing with CATL at the moment. One thing that maybe we forgot to mention uh, with the CATL announcement was that there is no um, additional rights uh, that CATL has in terms of offtake or, or rights of first refusal on financing. They are a partner. They're, they're just an equity partner at the corporate level as of today. We are hopeful and we are working towards a final partner or DAV structure that will finance the entirety of the project and hopefully it will be just with them. Uh, but that is now ongoing and hopefully we'll provide the market with, with that information as we have a more binding uh, financing terms and term sheets. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, I think the next one I can answer as well because it's pretty simple. Uh, somebody asked just uh, what was the LC, LCE price assumption over the mine life for the uh, pre-feasibility? And that was on an average basis. I mean, it's a curve, right? What you do in the PFS and a feasibility is that you ask a third party provider to give you a curve. Sometimes that priority provider will give you a flat curve. Sometimes it will be up and down or down and up, depending on what they believe the market is. In this case, it was Benchmark that provided the, the market analysis. And the average price over the mine life was $11,880 at the time of uh, having that pre-feasibility back in 2019. Uh, so we'll see what the price is. And obviously, you can run your NAV depending on, on the pricing that it is today currently or your long-term view of the price. Uh, what I can say is that Today's price is the lowest it has been, and we don't believe that's going to continue on. We, In fact, we believe that the price are going to significantly uh, go up uh, over the near term to medium term. Um, the next question, uh, and this we've, we've gone asked many times, and uh, I'll leave this to you, Aldo. Are you close to a national park? <laughs> no, there is no national park in this region. Uh, there is, uh, so no, we are not close or near any national park. Uh, so this is the very simple answer. There is a protected area for birds, um, uh, but 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 it's not here. So that it doesn't affect our our I mean, our, our project. It's not a national park. So no, we are not near national park. Okay. Um, next question, and this is uh, very technical, and I'll leave this up to you. What is the strateg stratigraphy of the Salar, and percentage of clastics versus percentage of salt? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, as an average, as an this this salar is formed by by. Let, let's summarize. In, 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 there is an upper an upper uh, upper salt unit that is very porous. Then there is a clastic layer. Then there is another salt unit that is tight, and then below that tight salt unit, there is another clastic unit below, more or less below 400 meters or 350 meters, you have another clastic unit. So there is porous salt, clastic, compact salt, clastic. So a bit complex and certainly not the same along the entire salar. For example, in the north where the high grade is all clastic. So if I have to make a profile in the northern sector where the tree lake is and is where the highest grade is, it's all plastic. It's just plastic. No, no, no salt or, or very little salt. Uh, if you go to the core of the salar in the center, you have more of these uh, salt units. So I hope that that clarifies the the question. Okay. Um, we have we are we are about seven minutes uh, towards the end. Uh, we have quite a bit of um, questions. Uh, I want to make sure that I grab some of the most uh, ones that you know we haven't really answered um but let me let me go through some of them here um uh let's see i think this is this is quite simple what 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 is the parts per million of your samples um i mean we don't i mean this is a pretty simple question but it's not a sample we already have a reserve calculation and uh, depending because we have a pfs the, the grade obviously it has different types of grade, but we're above a thousand milligrams per liter. But you can explain that more if you want to, Waldo, in terms of, you know, what's the difference between parts per million and milligrams per liter, which is an important one to make in this case. Sorry. What, what the question asked was the what grade is the of- What is parts per million of your, of your reserve base, I assume, or reserve? 
a, par, a PPM instead of a milligrams per liter. Yeah. When you have a liquid, when you have a liquid, you have to talk about milligrams per liter because in order to, to talk about parts per million, then the density has to be one. And therefore you can talk, if you have a uh, fresh water, you can talk about parts per million or milligrams per liter. But if you have brine and the density is like 1.2 of our brine, then you can't talk about uh, part per million. Uh, you have to talk about milligrams per liter. Otherwise, uh, for every number that you see, you will have a mistake or you will have to know the density of every sample. And when I just say that the density of every sample is 1.2, it's a general density because there are samples with 1.10, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So the only way to measure chemical content in a liquid is milligrams of that solute per liter or milliliter or whatever volume unit, not weight unit, because each sample weight different. Okay. Um, the next one will be, I think and we, we've done this. Uh, have you considered direct lithium extraction, similar uh, to Livent, for instance, to avoid the use of ponds and water? If, if, if not, why not? Oh, I do. I do. I do. We have already considered that, evaluated that, and the capital cost is double. The operational cost is low, is similar, is the operational cost, uh, but the consumption of uh, fresh water is environmentally crazy. So, so it's a big problem. And as a matter of fact, Levent has exactly that problem. Leven has been trying to expand for years and they have a severe freshwater problem and they have asked for a permit to bring fresh water from another basin and that permit has not been granted yet and that is what holding them for expansion. Leven production is relatively small. It's only 14, 17,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent per year and their limit on the production is not the salar is the fresh water. So think of that. Everybody that wants to use direct extraction technology needs fresh water. And you are in an area with no fresh water. So your capacity is going to be always very small. There are other issues with that technology that are related to, to sizing. Uh, uh, or, but, but those sizing issues can, can, be, can be fixed. The big problem of that technology is the consumption of fresh water. Right? It's, there is no fresh water there. Yeah, and I think this goes well to to the next question, which is: Can you can you please explain the sustainability of our pro of the three Q project, especially as it pertains to the water usage of the project? Absolutely. Uh, basically, uh, we use fresh water in very small quantities uh, for for uh, of course the camp. The camp has people and the people consume fresh water. And then we use industrial water, which is brine, but but, but very light brine. And, and there is a lot of that. Uh, in other words, uh, not lithium brine. I'm talking about simply a salty water that is not as salty as the one that you find in the salar. Um, and this is used to clean the hoses and to clean the equipment, uh, the pipes, the hose, the, the valves, and so on because these brines are so concentrated that when you put it in a pipe or in a valve, they become crushed because they precipitate and crust. So you need to inject a little bit of fresh water, or shall I say again, of not so salty water to actually wash it out. Uh, the consumption is very low. The brine that we evaporate is not fresh water, it's brine. And basically we produce fresh water into the environment. We release fresh water in the envi environment by evaporation. And then this is in the pond, in the pond system, where you have a very desertic environment. Okay, uh, the volume of fresh water that we consume up there is, is is minimal, like like literally minimal. I'm talking about a tap of water like running, like that volume. Um, then you go to the plant, the lithium carbonate plant, where uh, the consumption is a little bit higher, and we improve our system. Uh, to a new technology now, 
which uh, will consume about half the fresh water that we were consuming in our uh, pre-feasibility study. So instead, in terms of sustainability, our project will consume very, very little fresh water. You are talking about, uh, you know, uh, consumptions that are equivalent to, to human consumption and a little bit more. Very little fresh water is used. And it's very important because in these places, fresh water is not available. There is a lot of brine, there is a lot of salty water, but there is no fresh water. And life only thrives in fresh water. The, the, these, these brine lakes do not contain life, literally. The salt kills everything except some very particular bacteria, but everything else dies in that uh, brine. So fresh water is very precious in this region, and that's why it needs to be taken care of you know, well and protected. And also, Waldo, and just, just to add to that, can, can you go, can explain in terms of what volume we're, we're using as to, pertaining to what comes into the basin as opposed to what essentially we mine out of the basin? Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, in the basin, that you have a small amount of rain that falls every year and some snow that falls every year. And then you have hot springs that are yielding uh, basically through the hot springs, through a fault, a fracture system, hot water every year into the basin. So these are the sources of water. Okay. Um, by the way, the hot springs is simply recycled water because it's snow water that goes into the fracture, heated up, comes out and falls again into the salar. Uh, so all these, um, from all that, uh, shall I say, falling, our 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 extraction and consumption is is minimal. We will actually cause a depression on the phreatic level of the brine that is less than 10 centimeters. So realistically, our exploitation will not affect the salar uh, significantly at all. Also important to say there are no living communities around the salar. So there are no cities. It's important because around Olaros, there is a city, Cauchari, there is a several cities. In, in Atacama, there are cities. People live there. In our salar, in this region, Nobody lived now and nobody ever lived in the past. We did archaeological studies and, and perhaps too remote or too, too cold and nobody settled ever in that region. Okay, well, Waldo, thanks a lot. Um, and I think we're running, uh, it's a bit over 11. Uh, we've, been, we've been at this for about an hour. And uh, that, that essentially is the time we have allotted for the presentation. We thank everybody for their questions. Hopefully you have learned a little bit about you know, neolithium and, and these, some of the questions have cleared out some of your, you know, I guess, concerns and or questions that you have for, for management. Well, we're gonna try to do this every, every so often. Um, so you're informed of what we're doing uh, and hopefully we meet again through the same uh, medium uh, and you can uh, ask any questions you like. So thank you very much. I'm going to leave it up to six to uh, give the last words. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Waldo and Carlos, with regards to the questions uh, and also for the presentation. As Carlos said, uh, we're coming up to the end of our time together. If you didn't get a chance to get your questions answered or if you just thought of one now, I know we had a lot of great questions coming in today. Please stick around uh, after we close the room. There is a short survey where you can tell us how we did and also leave your contact details so that the Neolithium team can follow up with you directly to answer uh, any more questions that you have. Have. Uh, for any additional information, please visit their website at www.neolithium.ca. And as always, this recording will be available on six.com afterwards. All right. Until next time, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.